Hello, Booktube, and welcome back to Sumerian September in its final week. This is a celebration of Robert E. Howard's Conan that was dreamt up, of course, by, by Michael K. Vaughn, uh, where you read the original Conan stories. Go back to the original Conan stories, not bothered, not edited or pastiched or patched together by anybody, but the original stories. There are a couple of collections, a couple of volumes that will do that for you. Uh, and I have read those stories many, many times. I've read the pastiches many, many times. So I've, the path I've struck for Sumerian September, this time around anyway, is to go back to Marvel Comics' original black and white Savage Sword of Conan magazine, which ran for 200 and something issues. And a lot of the issues up above 150, especially above 200, I did not know at all. Uh, that was the focus of the beginning of my Sumerian September, but <laughs> this last week I've been looking at earlier issues. The ones that I know well, and some of the very early issues that I absolutely loved. Uh, I don't know why, just because I don't know if I'll get a chance to do this again. So I did that again last night. I reread uh, this. Savage Sword of Conan, number 22, from 1977. This great creepy cover there of a giant monster facing Conan. Uh, this is, Roy, Roy Thomas does the writing, and uh, John Buscema does the artwork, with, I think, uh, Sonny Trinidad does the inking here. Yes, Sonny Trinidad does the inking here. So it's it's washy, it's far more controlled and minimal than Alfredo Alcala, for instance, but it's far more suitable to Buscema's artwork than, for instance, Ernie Chan, who does the bulk of the inking for this artist in the run of Savage Sword of Conan. Uh, and this is the Pool of the Black One, Part One. This is this is to be continued. Uh, this is the beginning of Roy Thomas's comic book adaptation of Robert E. Howard's uh, follow-up to the last Savage Sword of Conan story that we saw. We read, we saw the Savage Sword of Conan adaptation of the Slithering Shadow that was done in Weird Tales, and the next Conan story that in 1933 that Howard had in Weird Tales was the Pool of the Black One, which is. It takes up with Conan when he has left one pirate group, the Barakan Pirates, and is going to another pirate group. He has deserted one pirate group for a rival pirate group. And he's done it in the most direct way possible. He has simply gone overboard <laughs> in a little boat, in a little coracle, and taken his chances on the open ocean of the Western Sea. And when the coracle is more, he's spending more time bailing it out than sailing it, he decides to just dive into the water and swim. <laughs> Which is why, at the beginning of this adaptation, uh, Sancha, who is the, uh, the beautiful woman in the story, she is the prize of the king, the, the leader of the new group of pirates that Conan is about to encounter. She is lazily dreaming on the deck. She's being left alone by the deckhands when suddenly Conan appears out of the ocean. <laughs> he's just, he crawls up the side of the ship. There is no way that you could do that, but he does, because he's Conan. And he just stands there in a pool of water. And the captain is dumbfounded, and points out that the sea is full of sharks, because so you couldn't possibly uh, reach me. Uh, Conan says, Just at dawn I saw your topsails and left the miserable tub to sink while I made better speed in the water. The captain says, these waters are full of sharks, and Conan gives a classic Conan response. So? <laughs> uh, the captain decides, you know, I could order my men to kill you, but I won't, uh, so you can go to work as a member of my crew, and Conan does. He, first, he breaks the neck of the one person who decides to spit in his face, and then he uh, becomes a member of the crew. Sancha is the exclusive property of the captain, but she still has the hots for Conan. She has, she has an eye for Conan, as all the, the women in these stories tend to do. Uh, but in the meantime, while she is the captain's possession, Conan is becoming beloved by the crew. He works harder than they do. He's not afraid to do any job on board the ship. He gambles with them and then gives away his earnings. He roisters with them and sings songs in multiple languages. They start to like him a lot more than they like their captain. Uh, especially since their captain is obsessed he has an obsessive desire. Very nice artwork here. Uh, he has an obsessive desire to find a hidden island that he believes contains enormous treasure that no one has seen. He has ancient charts and maps that he thinks will lead him there. And eventually it does in a stunning full page. 
illustration. Just stunning. Look at that. That is just amazing. <laughs> just amazing. The ship shows up in this this tropical wilderness. The men go on board. Uh, the captain refuses Sancho permission to go on board. She'd very much like to, but she she's accustomed. What does it say? What does the uh, does the narrative say? Sancho is used by now to being hurt without cause by her lover. So she just stays on board. The men go into the jungle, uh, and Conan goes with them, of course. And he sees the captain go off on his own into the forest, and he follows. Well, the captain is going off alone because he is certain that he has found the magic kingdom that he's looking for, the treasure that he's looking for. Uh, Conan goes off because he doesn't care about treasure. He just doesn't want to risk confronting the captain directly in front of his men. He's not sure of the loyalty of the men. So he confronts the captain alone. And the captain says, you, why do you follow me? And again, Conan has a quintessential line. He says, are you mad to ask? <laughs> because obviously his intention is to kill the captain, which he then promptly does. <laughs> uh, but uh, once he's killed the captain, and he's fairly certain that he'll take his chances winning the loyalty of the men, he notices that something about the, the whole of the jungle feels odd. It feels really weird. So he looks, he does a little exploring. The men aren't expecting him back right away. So he does a little exploring and finds an enormous city in the jungle. And it's not just enormous. It also, as the narrative points out, clearly wasn't constructed by men. It has weird symmetries and asymmetries that go nowhere. Uh, and as Conan probes further, he sees its inhabitants, and they are not human. They are ten feet tall, they are pitch black, so not the black races of Conan's, of Robert E. Howard's Hyperborean world, but rather alien beings. They have glowing eyes, they don't appear to speak, uh, they don't look human at all, and they tower over a terrified human they have as a prisoner. They're all gathered around the edge of a pool, and they play music that Conan can't hear, and it causes the air young prisoner to spasm around in a kind of weird parody of dance. A, a dance that he is not enjoying at all. It's, it's being done against his will. We're told it is as if the mute tune of the pipes grasps the boy's inmost soul with salacious fingers and with cruel torture wringing from it every involuntary expression of secret passion. It is a convulsion of obscenity, a spasm of lasciviousness, desire without pleasure, pain mated fully to lust. And when that, uh, that performance is over, once again we notice a non-human threat in a Conan story from 1933 that is directly sensual, right? The, the creature at the heart of Zuthal, the sleeping city in the slithering shadow, is not just eating people. He's ravish. It's ravishing them. That's made pretty clear. This also, the the boy, the poor, the poor victim, is not writhing in terror. He's writhing in lust. And then one of the creatures picks him up and dunks him into the pool. Uh, and Conan, what, they all march away after that silently. And Conan goes to explore, and he sees there's a row of statues on a shelf behind him there, and one of them is that boy who has been reduced to this terrified little statue. A horrifying thing that somehow was enacted by the pool. Conan is about to go back to his men, they're now his men, go back and warn them when he sees that one of these things has Sancha and is bringing her to the pool. He knows that he has to act, so he bursts out of cover and it turns out that although the thing is 10 feet tall, it's just a 10-foot-tall body of flesh. It, he easily kills it. He don't, it's unlikely that he could kill them all, but he, he thinks he might have to if, he doesn't, if they don't get away. So he kills this creature, and she tells Conan that when she, she broke, she disobeyed the captain of the pirates and went ashore anyway, uh, and was confronted by one of these things in the forest, and it carried her off. Uh, but as this part of the adaptation concludes, Conan sees that while he has been busy with Sancha and this one creature, the others have taken his men. They are bringing his, the entire crew to the pool. 
and this will result in the, the next issue is, is the big conclusion. This was a two-parter. The story goes on from here. Uh, we get a Solomon Kane adventure. And we also get, if I remember correctly, yeah, there's a, a spread here of the artist Howard Chaikin doing Robert E. Howard artwork. He does uh, Red Sonia there and Solomon Kane. Uh, does he do King Paul? He wasn't a big fan of King Paul, so no, he doesn't. And there's also a, an article here on uh, El Sprague de Camp, who was the the foremost pastiche and barbarizer of Conan that we're, that Sumerian September is sort of working against. Sumerian September says, go to the sources. Go to the original Conan stories. Do not read the weird... Uh, what is the, This article actually uses a term that... Uh, I bridled at it when I first read it, and... Uh, and I still do. Uh, yeah. It, El Sprague de Camp is referred to as editor, author, and collaborator of the Conan mythos. He certainly was not. He certainly was not a collaborator. You can't collaborate with someone who's dead. Uh, so there, there's a long profile of him. There are many profiles of him throughout Savage Sword of Conan. And uh, I find them very interesting. I, I find it impossible to ascribe to him the role of villain. I just do. I think ultimately when it comes to people loving Conan, I think he did a lot more good than harm. Uh, sniffing out the textual variations and getting to the root of what your favorite authors actually wrote and when and how they wrote them is something you're going to do anyway with any author who's a favorite of yours. Granted, El Sprague de Camp and Lynn Carter made it a little harder to do, but in the, in the process of making it harder, they also introduced this character, this world, to a whole bunch of readers who might not have known about it otherwise. I think that it's, it would be easy to attribute the vogue of Conan, from which we got Conan the Barbarian, the comic book, from which we got the Savage Sword of Conan, from which we got the Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. I think it's easy to attribute the, the vogue of Conan to El Sprague de Camp. Otherwise, this character might have disappeared into the, the heaps of pulps that had gone that had gone before i don't remember off the top of my head if i have issue number 23 the conclusion of this story uh but if the if i don't have it even if i do have it, i'm not going to do it tomorrow but if i if i don't have it one way or the other if the premise here intrigues you you should go and find the story in that big one volume the lance volume or the three del rey volumes you go and read the pool of the black one uh, it has really interesting features that it shares in common with both the Slithering Shadow, for instance, and the Tower of the Elephant, uh, the foremost of which I think is quintessential to Conan, which is that he encounters a dark, magical system or creature or circumstance or storyline that has nothing to do with him. It's been going on who knows how long, how many statues are there in the, on that shelf. These beings have been destroying transmuting, transforming terrified uh, sailors for a long, long time. Who knows where they come from, how they built this city when they appear to have no technology, how they have, why they do this one thing, what their culture is, where they come from. That is, to me, quintessential sword and sorcery, is that it doesn't do a whole lot of explaining where these things come from. It's just that Conan is encountering these things that have been going on since long before he was born. And he makes a difference. <laughs> In almost all cases, he makes a difference. There's no Tower of the Elephant after he's done with it. There's, and and uh, the same thing is true with the Pool of the Black One. No other sailors are going to meet this fate, I don't think. Uh, but definitely, uh, I mean, I loved it. I loved rereading this, but I de definitely use it as a, re a recommendation to go and read these original stories because they're well worth your time. <laughs> anyway, uh, that is your, your Conan dose for today, a very rainy, overcast day. No idea if these videos will upload. I'm hoping it might take forever to upload, but we shall see. <laughs> anyway, I will, I'll be back next time for more Conan. I'll see you then. Thank you. Too.